Here we're going to explore some of the strangeness that is complex integration. What do we even mean by a complex integral? Like, is the integral from alpha to beta of f of z dz well defined, where alpha and beta are complex numbers? And I really ask if it's well defined, because if you're thinking about the complex plane, and two numbers alpha and beta in the complex plane, then there are infinitely many paths that you can take from alpha to beta. So those are two such paths. We could have another path kind of like squiggling in the middle like that. If this type of thing is well defined, where all we're doing is talking about the starting point and the ending point, then that must say something about taking the integral about a different path. Okay, so how are we going to do this exploration? Well, we're going to set up two paths that go from 0 to the point 1 plus i. That's a complex number. And then we'll integrate two functions over those paths. So what will the paths in question be? Well, maybe the most obvious one first, which is the line segment starting at 0 and ending at 1 plus i. So notice that we can parametrize that by this thing I'm calling gamma 1 which is 1 plus i times t. So at t equals 0, we're at the origin, and at t equals 1, we're at the point 1 plus i. Then for our second path, we'll actually take a kind of two-piece path given by gamma 2 and gamma 3. So gamma 2 of t is just t. So as t goes between 0 and 1, that takes us from the origin to this point, which is one unit along the positive real axis. And then gamma 3 is 1 plus i t. So as t goes between 0 and 1, that takes us from this point 1 to this point up here, 1 plus i. So in the end, the combination of gamma 2 and gamma 3 represent a different path from the origin to the point 1 plus i. And if you want to see this more in depth, along with some general proofs, I've got a whole course on my second channel of complex analysis. And so that channel is called Math Major. Okay, so let's first do the integral over each path of the function z dz. Okay, so let's see, our first path is gamma 1, and so that means z will be equal to gamma 1, and our parameter, like I said, goes between 0 and 1. So that gives me the integral from 0 to 1 of gamma 1 of t, so that's going to be 1 plus i times t, times dz, but dz will just be gamma 1 prime dt. So the derivative of this with respect to t is just 1 plus i, and then we have a dt. So just FYI, we're using the fact that dz here will be gamma 1 prime of t dt. And so that follows just from typical line integral type stuff. And we'll use this throughout the other examples. But let's notice that that gives us 1 plus i quantity squared, and then the integral from 0 to 1 of t dt, which in the end gives us 1 plus i quantity squared over 2. Because the integral of t is just t squared, uh, because the integral of t is just t squared over 2, evaluated at 1 and 0, you get a half. But suspiciously, this looks exactly like what we would have gotten if we had naively integrated from 0 to 1 plus i of z dz by taking the so-called antiderivative of z. So taking the antiderivative of z would have given us z squared over 2, plug in the endpoints, and we get this. But what we're trying to figure out right here is, was that just luck? Or is this something happens that happens all of the time you have a so-called nice function right here? Okay, so anyway, let's move on to the second example, which if it's the same as this, then that gives us evidence that the integral is independent of path, and thus we could write something like this down. Okay, so let's see how this might go. So this is going to be the integral over gamma 2 of z dz plus the integral over gamma 3 of z dz. Now using this same sort of formula with gamma 2 and gamma 3 instead of gamma 1 there, we will have, let's see, for this first one, it'll be the integral from 0 to 1 of t dt. 
Okay, and then for the second one, we'll have the integral from zero to one of one plus i times t. And then the derivative of this with respect to t dt will give us i dt, like that. Okay, but let's watch this simplify out. So this gives us the integral from zero to one of t dt plus the integral from zero to one of i dt. So that's from multiplying this i through to this one minus the integral from zero to one of t dt, where we get the minus sign from multiplying this i with this i to give us i squared. But let's observe that this integral right here cancels this integral right here. And that just gives us the integral from zero to one of i dt. In other words, it gives us the complex number or the imaginary number i. And you might be a little worried because that doesn't look like what we got up here. But if we go and multiply this out, you'll see that we get one minus one for the real part because we get one squared plus i squared. i squared is negative one. And then for the imaginary part, we get plus 2i, but then that's all over 2 because we've got this 2 in the denominator. So that is, in fact, equal to i. So we got the same answer either way. So that gives us some motivation that writing it like this, which is kind of a path-independent way of writing this complex integral, is allowed, at least in this case. And we'll finish this video by proving that at least this function is path independent in terms of its integration. Okay, so now let's move on to the second example where we're taking the integral over the same paths of z bar, in other words, the conjugate of z. So let's see, for this one, we'll still integrate from zero to one, and now z bar, well, that'll be the conjugate of this, so that'll be one minus i times t, and then we'll have dz. Notice it's dz, not dz bar. So we get the same dz that we did right here. That is 1 plus i times dt. But now 1 minus i times 1 plus i is the number 2 because it's 1 squared minus i squared. That's 1 plus 1. So we get 2. And then the integral from 0 to 1 of t dt. But in the end, that gives us the number 1. So that being not equal to these two is fine at the moment because we're not integrating the same function. We would expect to get a different answer. Now, if we get a different answer down here, then there will be a problem because that means that this is not path independent. Okay, so let's play this out. So this is going to give us the integral from zero to one. We'll do the gamma two part. So notice gamma 2 is just t, so that is always real. So that'll give us t dt. And then we'll have plus the integral from 0 to 1. Now we need the gamma 3 part. So that means we need to take the conjugate of this. So that'll give us 1 minus i times t. And then dt is just i times dt. So we're left with something like that. And now we just have a bit of arithmetic to do. So notice the integral from 0 to 1 of t dt will give us t squared evaluated at 0 and 1. That gives us a half. And then let's multiply this i through. That gives us the integral from 0 to 1 of i plus t dt. Because negative i times i is positive 1. Okay, so now let's see, we'll get a half plus the integral of the i will just give us the number i, and then the integral of t will give us another half, so that gives us a half. So in the end, the answer is 1 plus i. So that means that this function z bar is not path independent. And in fact, even though z bar seems like it should be a very nice complex function, it doesn't have a lot of the properties that you would want a complex function to have. Okay, so like I said before, this function z seems to be independent of path when we take its integral from different paths to the same starting and ending point. Let's finish this video by proving that this function satisfies that rule. So we'll finish this video off by showing that the function z, so the identity function, is independent of path with regards to complex integration. So to do that, we'll set up an arbitrary path, we'll call it gamma, 
We'll scale it so it goes from the interval 0, 1 into the complex numbers. So gamma of 0 is alpha and gamma of 1 is beta. So it starts at alpha and ends at beta, but it's any path. Well, any nice path, I should say. So maybe that's smooth or something like that. Okay, like I said, we want to take the integral over gamma of z dz. So since we're integrating over gamma, z is always on the path gamma. So that means in the region that we're interested in, z is equal to gamma of t. But in order to be careful, let's break this down as x of t plus i y of t. So that's parameterizing the real and the imaginary parts of um, our curve gamma. But then if we have this is equal to z, then dz is easy to calculate. That is x prime of t plus y prime of t dt, like that. I guess I should say plus i y prime of t dt. Okay, so now let's go from there. So now we want to integrate from 0 to 1 of x plus i y. So I'll not write the of t just because it'll get a little bit messy. And then we have x prime plus i y prime um, dt. Now we can multiply this out maybe. So that gives us the integral from 0 to 1. My real part is x times x prime minus y times y prime. And then my imaginary part is equal to, let's see, x times y prime and then plus y times x prime. I'll write that as x prime times y dt, like that. But now we can actually integrate all of the terms here pretty easily. So these first two integrate by the chain rule. So notice that we have x and the derivative of x. So doing a substitution, that will give us x squared over 2. So here we get that this is x squared over 2. This right here will be y squared over 2. Well, let's just take the derivative of this with respect to t to make sure we're right. So the 2 comes down and cancels this. And then by the chain rule, we have to take the derivative of x, which gives us x prime. So we're OK there. And then we have plus i times, well, whatever the antiderivative of that is, that looks like it might be a little bit tricky. But upon further investigation, we notice that that is exactly what we would get if taking the derivative using the product rule. That is the derivative of x times y. So I can write that as x times y prime. So I have plus i times x y. That's what we get if we take the antiderivative. But I'm actually going to rewrite this a little bit. I'll write this as plus 2i x y over 2 just so that I have a 2 in the denominator everywhere. And now I can factor a 2 out. Oh, I need to put here that I should evaluate from t equals 0 to t equals 1. But after doing that, we see that this is exactly x plus i y squared. So this is x of t plus i times y of t um, quantity squared evaluated from 0 to 1. But let's notice if we evaluate that at 1, that's the same thing as having gamma of 1, which is beta. So that gives us 1 half of beta squared minus evaluating that at 0. But evaluating that at 0 gives us exactly gamma of 0, but that is alpha. So alpha squared. So we get 1 half beta squared minus alpha squared, which looks a lot like what we would have gotten if we would had integrated from alpha to beta of z dz just using some sort of fundamental theorem of calculus. So the takeaway here is for some nice functions, we're able to integrate just as we would with real variables. But those functions have to be a bit nicer than they were in the world of real variables. And if you want to know more about this, make sure to check out my second channel, Math Major, where I have a full course of complex analysis. And that's a good place to stop.